two, one. Good evening, everyone. Um, this is the Oxoc talk for October. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's nice to see you all virtually. And thank you to, to all of those uh, of you who have come to watch this talk this evening. Uh, I've been in discussions with the Northern branch um, who are uh, trying to organize some virtual talks too that will be added to the roster in due course uh, so that we can you know, add a, a more, represent, more representation from the Northern branch, so some Iron Age talks um, and so forth. So uh, look out for those talks, which will be scheduled um, probably more next year than, than this year. Um, but we just need to find some, some speakers who will agree to, to fill those slots. Um, but uh, we've got October. I'll run through the West talk this evening. Uh, we recorded this about a week ago. And the speaker this evening is Daria Presniakova. And uh, she's uh, come to South Africa about a year ago. works with Will Ong from uh, Tübingen University, and there have been many students and uh, researchers based at Tübingen who have been working on various sites in South Africa. Her particular interest is in hominin behavioral evolution in the early Stone Age, or the ESA, and uses quantitative approaches to study ESA stone tool technologies. Her primary interest is in patterns of hominin Indicated in stone tool many and the ecological variable. Her related interest is in the evolution of social transmissions through the Stone Age, which she examines through quantifying stone artifact production sequences and artifact shape variability. She's conducted collaborative research in Kenya, Kubi Fora, at Elansfontein and Montague Cave and Simon's Cave in South Africa and at Virushaya Volka, I hope I pronounced that correctly, in Russia, and is initiating a new project focusing on Middle Pleistocene Ashodian sites in a Southern African central interior. Um, her abstract is on the website, um, and it's going to be unpacked in detail in the talk. Um, and uh, yeah, if you need more information, it is on the YouTube page and uh, on our Facebook uh, announcement and on the, on the website. So uh, Daria is with me uh, this evening, so hopefully she can wave and just say hello. Hi, everyone. Hi. Good to, well, not good Excellent. not to see everyone, but I know you're here. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's based in Bloemfontein at the moment, and uh, so she's streaming in from there. And we'll be at the on, on the call at the end of the talk uh, for questions and answers, as usual. And please pop your questions in the chat box um, during the talk um, as soon as the questions come to mind and we'll do our best to, to answer. So I'm going to try and switch over to the, to the talk now. So just bear with me as I do that. Hello everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Nick and Yvonne and the Society for this wonderful opportunity to present my research today. And I will be talking about Shulin hominin landscape use and technological organization viewed from Kubifora localities in Kenya and a few sites in Southern Cape in South Africa. So the plan for today's talk is the following. I will introduce the Shulin and discuss the major issues surrounding this technology. And then I will present the theoretical framework for my work, which will be hominin organization of technology, and then talk about later Shulin at Elansfontein and early Shulin and Kubifora in the context of artifact curation, site fragmentation, and hominin planning. And I will finish with other examples of curation and provide future directions by discussing the sites of Cornelia and Montague. 
Since we might have an audience with various interests and expertise in archaeology, I would like to start with this graph, which shows hominin fossils on the left and major milestones in archaeological record on the right. And on the top here, we have Middle Stone Age and Later Stone Age, which were predominantly associated with uh, modernity, modern human behavior, and us, Homo sapiens. At the bottom here, we have the beginning of the archaeological record, which probably starts as early as 3.3 million years, as the newest discovery from the Mlomakwe site suggests. We certainly know that at 2.6, right here, we have a widely recognized stone tool technology called the Alderon, a cornflake technology which predominantly focused on flake production. And the theme of today's talk is the Shulin, which occupies this vast temporal space from about 1.8 million years to about 200,000 years. Alderon cornflake technology is relatively simple. You hit two rocks, hammer in the core, and make a flake. I use the phrase relatively simple as, as at the time of um, the older one, hominins already understood the basics of fracture mechanics and they knew about properties of raw materials and were selected about their raw materials. At about 1 million years, 1.8, sorry, million years, there's evidence that hominin behavior has changed, and that change manifests in the form of the Shulin technology, characterized by bifacial implements, also called large cutting tools, LCTs, but bifaces and hand axes are equally acceptable terms. The process behind the Shulin involved shaping of an artifact. Similar to the old one, the napper was still t uh, hitting two rocks, but now that is done with, his no with the notion of uh, shaping bifacially and bilaterally symmetrical artifact. And here's a, an example of um, such a symmetrical tool. The process behind making an older one called debitage, and uh, the technology is also referred to as mode one. The process behind the shulin is referred to as shaping or in the French term, fascinage, and the technology, also sometimes known as mode 2. There's a general trend that hominin brain increases with time, and some have suggested that emergence of the Shulin might have been associated with, the, with that brain growth and increased cognitive capacities. However, there were multiple hominin species who lived during the long span of the Shulin, and it's hard to link changes in the behavior to particular hominin and their abilities. And that complicates the story of the onset of the technology. Changing the cognition is one thing. Another big question, what is the adaptive significance of the Shulin? There have been attempts to link the emergence of the Shulin and other environmental events uh, in Africa with the continental scale environmental shift. For example, you can see here a graph from a paper by Peter de Manicol, published in um, Science, where um, the author linked the emergence of the new technology to a large-scale aridification trend that began around 1.8, 1.7 million years. However, data from local terrestrial climates and environments in Africa demonstrated much more variable and interchangeable um, conditions that global pa uh, patterns predicted. And absence of a single environmental shift, including lack of a turnover events in faunal communities associated with the Shulin. And so area around today's Lake Turkana, which is one of the cradles of human evolution, was known to switch between a lake phase and a river phase, a fluvial phase, many times in prehistory. And 
this is what these geological sections are showing. So we have a lake phase here, and then um, the, the fluvial, the river phase is here. And studies showed that um, during a lake phase, there were significant fluctuations shown here in the lake levels, causing constant and notable changes in local environments. And therefore, adaptive um, significance of Acheulean technology is not likely linked to a single event or specific environmental condition, such as the drying trend that I discussed in the previous slide. Adaptive significance or how technology contributed to hominin adaptation is a big question researchers asking today. From the initial appearance in East Africa at the site named Kokizile 6 in um, Kenya and another site in Ethiopia called Konza Gurdula, Large cutting tools appear in various parts of Africa and parts of the Old World. And here are some examples from various time periods and geographic locations. Generations of researchers worked on finding patterns within geographic and temporal variability in large cutting tools. I will highlight several explanations without going into too much details. Some researchers suggested a presence of geographically distinct groups such as African Hindexes or Asian Hindexes or European. And researchers identified form and shapes of LCTs that they thought were representative of each region. Geographical groups were also described on a smaller, more regional scales, for instance, French Hindexes or British Hindexes. And broadly, the idea of geographic variants stands for hominin knowledge transmission and preservation of a specific LCT form. Before one million years, sites that are known as um, early Acheulean have artifacts that do not always have this conventional uh, LCT forms of um, later Acheulean, as they are rougher and not extensively shaped and often are not symmetrical. And therefore, an alternative research notion is that large cutting tools were getting more refined through time as hominins were getting more and more skilled. One of the drawbacks in comparing LCTs between sites, regions, continents, and comparing older and younger Acheulean is that LCT, large cutting tool, is not a static form. Imagine Imagine a ceramic vessel or a ceramic pot. Once the ceramic object is made, it doesn't change its form through its life until one day it's broken in hundred pieces. Now imagine a pencil. Every day this pencil is used and sharpened and therefore it's changing, constantly changing its form until you get this little thing at the end of the uh, of its lifespan. Large cutting tools were not like ceramic pots. They were much more like these pencils. In the process of manufacturing, use, and maintenance, the shape of LCT will constantly undergo changes. The process of change related to manufacture and maintenance um, is called a reduction. Here shown is the work of Shannon McFerrin, who was among the first archaeologists to demonstrate that um, a large cutting tool on the left, shown here, and the large cutting tool on the right, here, did not represent different Shulian traditions, as it has been previously suggested. McFerrin uh, demonstrated that shapes were different because they belonged to different stages of reduction the earlier stage and the later stage. Importantly, hominins could discard unwanted artifacts at any stage of artifacts life history. Reduction and more precisely stages of reduction uh, uh, will affect our interpretation of geographic and temporal variability and therefore should be taken into consideration. In the process of reduction shown here again, Large cutting tool is not the only player in the Shulian system. The process begins with acquisition of boulder cores, 
and then of produ the production of um, large flake blanks. Some researchers have suggested that the production of big flakes and their use as blanks for, to make large cutting tools is equally defining the Shulin as large cutting tools themselves. You simply don't find this big course like that in the older one. And this boulder course would require different strategies in raw material procurement, transport, and landscape use. Following the acquisition of the blank, processes of LCT roughing out, shaping, reshaping, leave characteristic traces such as these flakes here that have very specific morphologies. As we will see later in the talk, Investigating presence of shaping flakes can tell a lot about hominin site use and landscape use. Famous archaeologist Lewis Binford, based on his ethnographic studies of modern-day hunter-gatherers in Alaska, was among the first to suggest that a single artifact class might be misleading in interpreting behaviors and adaptive significance of technology. Only the analysis of multiple elements within a technology, the distribution of artifacts at the site, and a distribution of activities uh, on the landscape reveals hominin organization of technology, which is a fancier way to express an interest in hom how hominins were beha uh, behaving on the landscape where they lived. We start with the a landscape or environmental conditions that have certain resources, you, uh, food, water, raw materials. Resources on the landscape will af affect economic strategies that were used either by hunter-gatherers that Benford was describing or by the Shulian hominins. For hominins, a strategy could be to optimize the use of a raw material or to find a better quality raw material or to sh shorten the distance to the source among other strategies that could have been related to food procurement. We will assume here that optimization of resources and time was a priority. Economic strategies influence technological strategies, and technological strategies in turn will affect activity distribution, site function, and artifact design. Since this talk will predominantly focus on technological strategies, I will talk more about them in the later slides. In addition to economic strategies, social strategies may also influence um, technology. For example, Polly Wiesner, in her work on style and social information of projectile po uh, points in Kalahari Sun, discussed how social practices were reflected in styles and designs of these points. How and how much social strategies influence technological strategies in the Shulin, these are big questions. I will only touch upon this topic today. However, unlike many of my colleagues who um, start with discussion of social strategies and artifact design, I think it's better to, or maybe more productive, to uh, to first link behaviors and technological strategies to the resource on the landscape. And of course, to remember that we are dealing with the very dynamic form that's of, of an artifact that will change with the reduction. The main division of technological strategies is curated versus expedient or situational. Binford argued that techn uh, technologies intended for future use, meaning curated technologies, only appear during the Upper Paleolithic. Subsequent studies have supported this um, view that advanced cognitive abilities associated with planning depth only emerge with behaviorally modern humans. Situational or experience strategies we can definitely see in the early Stone Age. For example, the older one had been dubbed as the expedient flake production strategy. And here's an example from a well-known site called Local LA2C, where all flakes and cores could be conjoined or refitted back together. It means that napping um, took place at this site and nothing has been transported for future use. But many disagree with this rigid definition of curated technologies. 
for example, Mick Connard and Dan Adler, analyzed refits and raw materials from um, Middle Paleolithic site at Wallertheim in Germany, associated with Neanderthals. They documented an interaction between raw material type and stage of reduction at the site. So for rhyolite, which was a precious raw material transported from far away, only resharpening and maintenance stages of reduction were present at the site, which were not the case for other raw materials that were uh, located closer to the site. The authors argued that Neanderthals had curated technologies and therefore had capacities for long-term planning. Another fascinating example comes from chimpanzee. Here we have a map of um, the site called Panda 100, which provide evidence of um, short distance curation of artifacts, in particular the uh, uh, anvils, uh, and it's a chimpanzee site. And also the recorded examples on the left show uh, chimpanzee curating either nuts and fruits in their hands or anvils and hammers. These examples cannot be compared um, to the level of curation that has been recorded for modern hunter-gatherers. Would this suggest that curation versus situational or expedient production is a gradient and not a binary present absent variable. And since curation implicates planning abilities and cognition, we should ask ourselves how much uh, curation was taking place in the issue. So here are the issues that I want to address in my research. The first one being curated versus situational technological strategies in the issue. And importantly here is how it's related to planning capacity. The second issue is how the strategies affect the form and the shape of artifacts at the site, as well as the types of artifacts we encounter, including non-LCT elements at the site. And in that, we will discuss the site function. The above-mentioned issues will bring us to how hom uh, Ashulian hominins used landscape and available resources. And how did the landscape use change with time, from early to late Acheulean? An important disclaimer here is that post-depositional site formation processes can easily override hominin behaviors or even create new sites that were not related to hominin and their behaviors. So sites that we will discuss today were selected because they were less affected by this post-depositional processes. Curation in the Shulin has been described as sequence fragmentation or site fragmentation, and the terms re term refers to spatially structured artifact discard patterns, appears archaeologically as if artifact manufacture cycle at different sites has been interrupted. In other words, Fragmented assemblages represent windows onto a continuous but spatially differentiated artifact manufacturing system. The term and the graph comes from the study by Jane Hallis, published in Journal of Human Evolution. And the author, she did um, a refit analysis from several Shulin Briti uh, sites in Britain, and she reported that these sites, or some of these sites, were fragmented. Her work um, inspired me to think about fragmentation and curation in the Shulian sites. And here I would like to talk about the study at Ellensfontein, South Africa, where with a group of colleagues we addressed the issue of site use, curation and fragmentation. Ellensfontein is an open area uh, site. It's a dune field in the Western Cape not far from Cape Town, and I'm sure many of you have visited the site or know the area well. It's a middle Pleistocene locality with a biostratigraphic date between 1 million to, uh, and to, uh, 600,000 years. And the research started in the 1950s when 
Ronald Senge reported a Saldania skull from the area, which is a Homo heidelbergensis specimen. Then in the 60s, John Weimer from the UK and um, Ray Enskip, who was the head of the Department in Archaeology of Archaeology at UCT, um, started working at Ellensfontein and they excavated the biggest site um, called um, Cutting Ten. And I should mention that among many other researchers, Hilary Deacon uh, worked at Ellensfontein and Richard Klein described the fauna. From 2007, Dave Braun from GW initiated a project, and here's a picture of his 2013 season, and that's when I joined the team and was able to look at the collections. Cutting Ten site is the Schulen site at Illensfontein with a single occupation horizon and a rather small collection of artifacts. So there are flakes not shown here, and large cutting tools, as you can see on this photo, and um, older one like cores, such as these two at the bottom of the picture. It's actually not uncommon for older one like cores and flakes to be present at the Schulian sites. At Elansfontein Cutting 10, there is also a rich faunal collection. So here are the two hypotheses that, with my colleagues, um, we are outlined for ourselves. Because there were both flakes and LCTs at Cutting 10, the null hypothesis was that the site represented a, a place of manufacturing activities. The alternative hypothesis was that some elements, like, like large cutting tools, have been manufactured elsewhere and then transported to the site. To address the function of Cutting 10 site, and because the site had both, Schule elements and older one like, also um, called mode one um, cores present in the context, in this in one context, we decided to quantitatively um, classify flakes. We assumed that each napping process, the older one and the Schulen, had very different requirements. Um, remember this first slide that I showed to you, and this picture showed the difference between older one production strategies and the Schulen. For large cutting tools, the central objective was the maintenance um, of the volume and symmetry of a tool during a shaping process. The length, and shown here, the resulting flake of this process, the length and shape of a working edge of flakes relative to their morphology and the maintenance of the core edge angles um, is the focus on older one debitage systems. It's reasonable that these very different napping objectives resulted in quantifiably different um, sets of products and waste. And thus we decided to test if we could distinguish between these two groups of flakes using a multivariate statistical methods. A big part of the study was relying on experimental um, assemblage. Using the same raw materials that we encounter in the archaeological assemblage, we made flakes by means of Acheulean shaping and older than debitage techniques. Then we have selected a series of uh, variables that are shown here um, in this figure. And these variables, they focus specifically on the technologically relevant components of flake shapes. We then took measurements on experimental flakes and then measured archaeological flakes. And then we used this statistical algorithm called discriminant function analysis, where we first check if the algorithm could correctly classify experimental flakes into shaping and older one like flakes. So in doing this, we trained this algorithm. And then if algorithm worked well, we would ask it to predict um, the groups of unknown archaeological flakes from cutting 10. Here we are first looking at the histogram that shows the result of discriminant function analysis classifying uh, experimental flakes. And what we see here is that the algorithm worked very well. 
87% of the flakes were classified correctly in their respected uh, groups, either as um, mode 1, older one like flakes, or mode 2, Schulen like flakes. And then, and so that showed to us that we could quantitatively distinguish older one like and Schulen like flakes from one another. And then, <clears throat> Using the same statistical algorithm and its predictive capacity, we classified archaeological flakes um, from cutting 10. And the second um, histogram shows these classifications uh, of flakes into older one like, labeled as group mode 1 here, or Schulen labeled as group mode 2 here. The analysis suggests that the majority of flakes 68% in the cutting 10 assemblage were the products of older and like technological strategies. And since the majority of flakes in the collection were the result of making flakes via debitage, that suggested that there was little, very little activity related to large cutting tool, uh, tool manufacturing process. And therefore, large cutting tools were probably made elsewhere and then transported to Ellensfontein cutting 10 locality in their reduced form. And at the site, there is probably some maintenance um, activities happening, um, large cutting tool maintenance, as we do have uh, this uh, smaller percentage of shaping flakes present. So, the study confirms a differential discard of LCTs at Ellensfontein cutting 10. Although the site had numerous, um, numerous large cutting tools, they were not produced at this locality. It means that the reduction sequence at cutting 10 was fragmented. And the site only had the final stages of LCT maintenance and therefore a small number of shaping pre uh, flakes present. And thus we were able to reject the null hypothesis. The diagram shows um, hominins making and using uh, large cutting tools at um, different places on the landscape. At the same time, the older one like cores have been expediently produced at the site. So the site had dual function as a production place as well as the a place where LCTs have been brought to and discarded. Whether it was one group of hominins using both situ situational and curated gear, or there were two different groups of hominins is a bit difficult to tell. The method developed in this study of differentiating, differentiating flakes um, could be applied to other sites. So here we discuss the site uh, use and curation at, the, uh, at Ellen's Fontaine Cutting 10, which is thought to be a site younger than 1 million. As you may recall, before 1 million, um, large cutting tools such as the one shown here from Cocazile 4 are different from younger Ashulian large cutting tools such as the one shown here from Montague. And therefore, to add time to the question of landscape use, site use, and Planning abilities, the question becomes whether early Shulian sites have also been fragmented or they rather resemble the older one sites. And here are two drawings that outline two scenarios. The first one, the older one landscape used, where everything largely happens on the spot. A second scenario on the right is the one that we just discussed for this later Shulian site, Ellensfontein. So the question is, to which scenario does the early Schulen landscape um, use belong? That gives me a chance to talk about the early Schulen sites from Kubifora, which is in East Africa on the east shore of Lake Turkana in northern Kenya. There are four earlier Schulen sites called FXJJ65, FXJJ63, FXJJ21, and FXJJ37. These sites are semi-contemporaneous with an age that we got from volcanic ash of 1.39 million years. Here's an old photo of um, Lake Turkana. 
And before talking about uh, my own research in Kubifora, I would like to credit the work of other archaeologists who inspired me. Of course, Glenn Isaac who worked in Kubifora since the 90s when Richard Leakey invited him to join the multidisciplinary project and to head the archaeology part of the project. Glenn mostly focused on Oliven site in Kubifora, and then his PhD student at the time, Jack Harris, here on the photo, uh, he took over excavating the Karari sites and also the early Shulian sites. And Jack Harris was my PhD supervisor. And then Kay Berensmeyer at the bottom here, she actually discovered the first older one site in Kubifora, and now it's named after her. But mostly she is known for her work on reconstructing past landscapes and um, discussing these issues of taphonomy. And Frank Brown, of course, he's a geologist who has been instrumental in developing a database of volcanic tufts, which allow correlating ages between the sites. And of course, in the area that is so prolific for research on hominin evolution, there are many more people who have done or currently doing some interesting and important work. But if I will run out of time uh, talking about all of them. And here is the picture of overviewing the uh, earlier Shulian site called FXJJ65 at the time when I was excavating it for my PhD. And here are the pictures of the, of the site here. And um, here is the concentration, in situ concentration of earlier Shulian artifacts. And here is the piece uh, plot of artifacts. And here we have large cutting tools from all four sites in Kubifora for earlier Shulian sites, I mean, 65, 63, 21, and 37. And it is important that all artifacts made on basalt. So this factor reduces a potential source of variability. And once again, the sites have a similar age, and that also eliminates another source of variability. And as you can see on these pictures and drawings, large cutting tools at this earlier Shulin sites come in different shapes and forms. Because of this visible difference in shapes and forms, the first question was to understand the amount of variation that existed among LCTs and Kubifora. Yet our null hypothesis was was that no statistically significant um, uh, difference existed in large cutting sh uh, tool shapes between the four sides it could be for. If the alternative hypothesis would be accepted, then we wanted to know what drove variation in large cutting tools. Was it the reduction? As you may recall, reduction reflects on LCT life history, and the process is directly linked to economic strategies. Alternatively, were there any other drivers of variation, such as social traditions or style? Second question was to see what variation in large cutting tools could tell us about hominin landscape use. And then, um, finally, how other elements of a Shulian technological system, such as flakes, complement the story of large cutting tools. We explored large cutting tool shape analysis using 3D geometric morphometrics. This quantitative analysis of shape originated from biology, but for more than a decade, it has been successfully applied in stone tool analysis. The geometric morphometric is based on finding corresponding landmarks on all the specimens submitted to the analysis. And here shown is the process of transferring landmarks, surface landmarks, from a target specimen to a template. We started the analysis using, again, the experimentally made large cutting tools, which allowed us to define to define independent proxies of reduction. For example, one of these proxies was a measurement called centroid size, shown here on all these graphs. 
So here we see the result of a linear model called generalized linear model, where proxies of reduction predict shape of large cutting tools. So on this graph, each of these dots represent the large cutting tool shape, and we have a proxy of a reduction on the x-axis, and we're trying to predict the shape on the y-axis. There are two important observations provided by this model. First, there are statistically significant difference in shapes of large cutting tools between four earlier Shulian sites and Kubifora. It means we could reject our null hypothesis that said, said that there was no variation in large cutting tools. There is variation. Second, reduction predicts art artifact shape well for all four sites. And the way shape changes with reduction uh, at 63 and 65 sites looked extremely similar. You can see here. And these sites um, seem to have all stages of LCT reduction, while sites 21 and 37 represent different fragments of large cutting tool life history, and some, some uh, shapes were not uh, present. Importantly, once we removed the effect of reduction at look, and looked at the residual variance, meaning the Variance, the remaining variance that was not explained by reduction, there were no statistically significant differences between sites. It means that there were um, no differences in terms of style or cultural tradition. So we can cross this one out. If there are statistically significant differences in large cutting tool shapes between four contemporaneous sites and Kubifora, and it explained by the difference in reduction intensity. What does it tell us about hominin landscape use? This is a density plot, which looks rather complex, but it delivers a simple message. These peaks here show the central states of reduction of large cutting tools for all four um, early Shilin sites and could be four. Since this peaks um, are distributed in different places um, on, on the plots. Uh, it means that artifacts are discarded at different points of their life cycles at, at different sites. So at 65 and um, 63 sites shown here, we have more variation in discarded LCTs and they are less reduced and more reduced tools um, that were discarded. At sites 37 and 21, um, they have these fragmented cycles with only more reduced um, large cutting tools uh, for, uh, present. To sum up, at some sites, large cutting tools life cycles from quarry to discard is complete or nearly complete, as you um, can probably see for sites 65 and 63, so these are initial stages of production and these are the final stages of production. And after Binford, we call these sites gearing up sites. At the sites like 37 and 21, stages of life history are missing, so they don't have this initial phase present. And that suggests that initial manufacturing stages was taking place elsewhere, and then hominins transported artifacts to these localities. That suggests that hominins were curating their tools and then planning the distribution of their activities on the landscape. Let's leave large, uh, large cutting tools for a moment and talk about flakes again. So to recap, since the older one and the Shulin technologies have strategically different objectives. Um, it allows to quantitatively uh, distinguish flake shapes as we did at Ilan's Fontaine Cutting 10. Again, here we we'll, uh, use the statistical algorithm with experimental flakes, and we taught the algorithm how to distinguish between the older one like and the Shulin like flakes, and then the, ask the model to classify unknown archaeological flakes from Kubifora. 
Similar to Ilansfontein, in earlier Schulen sites and Kudbifora, there is large um, LCT, uh, non-LCT component, this Oldovan course. And the graphs here show this uh, point. You can see in orange we have LCTs, and in turquoise, this Oldovan-like cores that are present in all sites and particularly abundant at the 37 sites. So when we find flakes at these localities, were they part of Oldovan-like core reduction strategies or related to large cutting tool manufacturing processes? The quantitative classification shows that the majority of flakes across sites belong to mode 1, Oldovan category, and there are fewer flakes related to shaping of Asurian hand axis. And what does it mean? Sites 65 and 63 have large cutting tools discarded at all stages of their life histories, as I've been just um, discussing earlier. And then site 63 has a few boulder cores shown here that were likely used to make flake blanks for large cutting tools. Looking at flakes here, both 65 and 63 sites um, have large flakes that could have been blanks for large cutting tools. So when we look back at this graph, it appears that flakes that fall into so-called mode 1, Oldovan-like category shown in, on, the, on the plot in beige, um, they must have been this large flake blanks that, that were part of the uh, large cutting tool technological system. And this observation strengthens the result of 3D GM analysis about the gearing up functions of the site. The situation is different at the site 37, affected day 37. This graph shows here that the mean size of the flakes um, in pink is smaller than the mean, mean size of the LCTs. It means that there were no flakes that were big enough at this site that could have been used as blanks to make large cutting tools, which contrasts the site to 65 and 63. If we look again at this graph, first, there are flakes shown in blue, labeled as mode 2, so they were related to um, Shulian shaping, and here are a few examples, photographs of a few flakes from FXJJ37 that could have been the, um, this uh, shaping flakes. On the other hand, flakes that were classified by the algorithm as mode 1 or older than debitage flakes are less likely related to large cutting tool process, production process. The parsimonious explanation is these are flakes manufactured in situ using the older one like core and flake strategy, and that happens parallel, not necessarily at the same time, but parallel to transport of half-made large cutting tools to the same locality. So there may be a co-occurrence of more expedient-like technology and the one that has been curated, which is similar to Ilan's Fontaine cutting tent scenario. It's interesting that FXJJ37 site turned out to be more complex than we would assume from just studying large cutting tools on their own. The site is closer to the source of the raw material than any other sites um, in or any other early Chilean sites in Kibifora. And perhaps this proximity corresponds to high proportion of mode 1, older one like cores, and in situ production of mode 1 flakes. While large cutting tools, regardless of raw material proximity, do not have this full production sequence, which is a very interesting observation. To recap, the 3D GM analysis showed that variation in large cutting tools is underpinned by reduction, and differences between sites were related to distinct st uh, stages of reduction present. And this variation was spatially structured at Kubi 4 The differential discard 
of artifacts among semi-contemporaneous sites suggests that hominins might have been planning their activities on the landscape. It doesn't necessarily mean that all the sites have been used simultaneously, but we can discuss it after the talk. <clears throat> Although there were more large cutting tools, the proportion of non-Acheulean mode 1 flakes dominates this early Acheulean assemblages. And studying these flakes can end, add another dimension to hominin use of the landscape. And then the next thing I would like to ask is sequence fragmentation and differential landscape use is a widespread phenomenon in the Julian. Here is a study from a locality called Mjesa in Ethiopia conducted by Delatorian colleagues. There are multiple Acheulean localities um, dated to about 212,000 years, so it's a later Acheulean site. There is minimal indication of non-hominin agent influence artifact concentration at Miesa, so it's similar to um, Cutting 10 and um, Kubifora. One site that does appear to have a similar organization to Ellensfontein Cutting 10 is Mieso 7. Shaping at Mieso occurred prior to the appearance of large cutting tools at the site, and um, these tools appear in a very late stage of reduction when they were discarded, and the authors reported no shaping flakes from this site. At another site, called Mieso 31, that is about 3 kilometers away from Mieso 7, uh, LCTs were produced at the site and then subsequently were taken away, as this uh, sequence of the fits shows us. So this pattern of fragmentation is similar to another Acheulean site called Boxgrove in the UK, and you can see here a sequence of refitted flakes, but um, there's a hole in the middle, as particularly you can see it here, and it's a missing uh, large cutting tool which has been transported away from the site. The complete or nearly complete um, production sequence at earlier Shulian sites and could be 4, 65 and 63 are not like Mieso 31 and Boxgrove, since these later Shulian sites, I meaning Mieso and Boxgrove, only retain initial phases of production. And this way, Mieso and Boxgrove, like Kubikfora, also had differential, differential landscape use. But when you look at the functions of individual sites, there might be difference between early and later Acheulean sites. And I will finish the talk with this project that I'm initiating now in, here in South Africa specifically at these two localities, Cornelia and Montague Cave. Cornelia has a published paleomagnetic age of about one um, million years, and for Montague, our team just got the ages, but they're still unpublished, so I will just say it. it's a late Acheulean site. So these two sites give opportunity once again to contrast and compare how technological organization was changing from early to very late Acheulean. Cornelia is an open-air site on the Val River, and the most recent excavations have been led by the late James Brink, and today Lloyd Russo from the National Museum at Bloemfontein, who worked with James Brink. Uh, so Lloyd today creates the collections. And here's the picture of reviewing the site. Unlike other Acheulean sites on the Val, Cornelia is um, in the floodplain and relatively um, low energy uh, depositional environment, which facilitated good preservation of artifacts and fauna. There are several reasons behind my fascination with Cornelia. First, it's a close association between fauna, hominin remains, and artifacts. There are very few sites like that which allow addressing the behavior of unambiguous hominin species and to reconstruct their immediate environment using uh, fauna as a proxy. And at this site, we have a hominin tooth found in situ, and um, as shown in this picture, for example, a scapular fragment, 
shown here, that sits, uh, still sits on the top of a cleaver. I don't know yet whether this particular cleaver was used to process the scapula, but it still remains um, for us to investigate what is the nature um, of association between hominins and fauna. The second reason for my fascination with the site is that preliminary analysis of large cutting tools suggests that each tool has been appears to have been discarded at a very similar stage of their life cycle. And there's not much variation among large cutting tools at this site. So that suggests that it was not a, an Acheulean production site where we would expect higher variability among discarded LCTs. And that site might be similar to Elon's Fontaine site or to FXJJ37 site, but I'm very curious to properly investigate it and to link the fauna to the surrounding landscape. Montague Cave in the Western Cape, on the other hand, is a very different site. It's a, uh, it's a very late Ashulin, as I already mentioned, and it's a cave site, which is very unusual for an uh, unusual site type for the Ashulin. Everything about Montague is grand. The size of the cave, as you hopefully can see on this photo, it's huge. The, a very big collection of Acheulean artifacts that are in pristine um, condition, very well preserved. And this impressive laminated deposits that facilitated preservation of the artifacts. And usually these laminated deposits are found um, in Middle Stone Age sites in South Africa and not in the Ashulian sites. Here are examples of large cutting tools from Montague. Um, artifacts are made up on quartzite and the source uh, is available below the site in the river. And these are um, the reduction stages that we identify. And intriguingly, Montague has all stages of reduction and doesn't have the fragmentation of the sequence. And therefore, we have Montague, which seemed to have a full sequence of production and initial production and maintenance and use of artifacts and recycling and, um, and, and discard. And that contrasts, um, contrasts this side with Ilan's Fontaine. And the question is, was it a production site or was it a situational gear expediently produced? These are the questions that we still hope to answer. And with that, I would like to thank you for your time. And I would like to thank my wonderful colleagues who have been so helpful in um, my research. Thank you. And I'm happy to take the questions. Hi everyone. Um, there's probably a little lag between the um, the stream, which will go on repeat for for a few seconds while we we cross over. Um, so yes, Daria, are you back and can you hear me okay? Hi. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Perfectly. Excellent. Great. All right. We're all set for the for the questions. And. Uh, just going to put that on mute so I don't have two people speak to, speaking my ear. Um, and uh, we've got a question. Hi, um, there's probably a little lag. Lisa. And uh, she's wondering about the site, so um, whether they could get a list of the site. So perhaps we could, I know there were a lot of sites discussed um, in the in the talk, so perhaps we could post that as a as an appendix Appendix to the to the talk or in the comments box, perhaps after the after the talk. Um, yeah, because I think um, I think you made, you glossed over quite a lot of sites and then focused on a few important sites. Um, so yeah, I think maybe do that afterwards. Um, but yes, there's yeah. a lot of sites to, to talk. Yeah, no problem at all. I'll I'll send you the list. Yeah. 
Super. Um, uh, Polite uh, just wanted to say thank you. Very interesting and informative presentation. Um, thank you. So much. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, there's some hellos as well. Uh, Ludolf, I don't know Ludolf, but hello, Ludolf. <laughs> Um, hi, hi Rudolf. <laughs> hopefully you know Rudolf. Um, <laughs> no, I do. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I've got a. I have a question for you though, uh, and okay. perhaps it's it's good for the for the members because I think that perhaps you could discuss how because you do your work is very very technical um, and uh, you know. I think maybe to non-archaeologists it might be quite intimidating all the stats that you have to compile and these beautiful illustrations you know thank you again um which was really clearly laid out but perhaps you could just chat about why it's so difficult to work in the uh in the early 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 part of our of, of our hominin evolution um thank you um yeah i know that the talk was full of stats but i deliberately decided not to not to change it and keep it the way it is the way science is because that's first of all very close to my heart and second um i just thought that's that's what we do so part of our job is to go and excavate sites and maybe the uh, members of the society have seen talks where people talk about this new discoveries that they make and the case but then the second part is you sit in the in front of the computer or the lab and you do <laughs> that um so uh yeah and uh, the, so the question um i talked a bit about um behavioral ecology and i was referencing binford and poly business some uh, well i mean binford is already gone i mean he's, he's, he's not with us anymore but um these people they went and observed people uh, like modern hunter gatherers doing things and from that with difficulty they could make inferences of how people lived uh, what what resources were important to them? How did they rank these resources? How 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 what what did they do on the landscape uh, where they lived? And we just as archaeologists, we just don't have this luxury of actually observing hominins, uh, and we have very very. I kept on using the word fragmented fragmented sequence, but we have very fragmented information. So we have tiny, tiny bits of information given to us. And from that, we're really trying to extract as much as we can. And that's why we constantly um, make, well, we don't make, but we use newer methods. We, uh, we are up to date on all the discussion of statistical methods, like new artificial intelligence. It's entering archaeology because we're just trying to do the best we can to get as much information about the past and what people are doing and how they lived, how they behaved. Um, yeah. Mm. Yes, I think that's a great, great answer. Yeah, because I think, uh, you know, the further back you go, the more difficult it is to, um, you know, get contextual sites. Montague Cave is such an exceptional um, site, you know, where you've got stratified deposits. Um, you know, most of the time you're just dealing with um, open sites. Um, you know, and then maybe another follow up to that is also how do you account for or control for um, the, the compounding effect of time, you know, as as hominin started, uh, you know, with reduction and quarrying raw materials, rock and start and started moving this all over the landscape. Um, that material, you know, the sort of day zero, if you like, uh, and as that moved across, um, would have meant that um, subsequent hominin populations had access to raw materials mm. that weren't necessarily at the raw material source. Um, so you're always dealing with a, a changing landscape that, uh, you know, hominins are changing themselves. So how do you how do you control for that? It's actually an awesome question because it's a big, um, big thing in uh, such the in early stone um, stone age, but actually in later periods as well. And we refer to it as time aver averaging. So when I think from 
I think that's what you were talking about. It's an overprint of many behaviors, right, of individuals or groups that you see as an archaeologist as um, one layer, but actually it's not happened in the course of the same day or uh, yeah, even maybe years. It can be thousands of years um, between these events. And um, it's actually, yeah, it's, it's difficult because... Some things you can address with geologists and really understanding how the formation of the site, the um, sedimentation processes, how quickly the sedimentation, how quickly the artifacts were buried. If it's a um, site next to the river where things happen very fast and you can have a flood and it just buries the artifacts and then next people come, but you can you would be able to see that. So that's great. But that's not always the case. And then um yeah then it's 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 hard because um what you're trying to see if how strong is your signal so for instance um cornelia right that side that i showed at the very end it has um artifacts that have been discarded at the later stage of reduction and all of them are discarded at the at the same stage so it means that for some reason, even if hominins are coming, you know, once a year and drop one artifact in a, in a year, and we still have a, a same sort of behavioral season, a uh, signal, sorry. And the same could be said of like going back to could be forest sites, right? Um, sites that that I didn't call the production sites, right? That didn't have the initial production phases and um, hominins brought in already manufactured artifacts and then discarded them. Once again, even if, uh, because you have the same signal from all these artifacts, even if it happened not in the course of the same day, you still, like, it, it still tells you something that um, this locality meant this for this hominin. So, and it didn't change in the course, like, of, even hundred or maybe a thousand years. Mm. So it's about, yeah. it's all about the strength of this like behavioral signal. But mm. I, yeah, I think yeah, you just have to assume that this time averaging is always going to be there. You don't have mm. this Pompeii kind of sites, which, you know, that happened in one day, it got buried and that's it. <laughs> it's um, mm. yeah, impossible. Yeah, yeah, and I think I suppose with uh, yeah, it's again such deep deep time. <laughs> you really are having to work very very hard, um, just getting a record, just getting sites that fall into the right period that you're trying to compare. So the Kubi Fora sites you illustrated was just you know just such. I don't think people understand how lucky people are in working in Kubi Fora in that particular period to, to have that lens where you can look at multiple sites all contemporaneous. Um, it's, it's, it's semi-contemporaneous. So that's the thing. Yeah. And like we, we don't, yeah, we are super lucky to have this, the sites and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very seldom happens in this early shoe in context or early, early stone age context. Um, but there are, we, um, keep on saying that they're semi-contemporaneous. So the, the idea that hominins, hominins are not necessarily going from the site 37 that I talked about to site 65, and it happens, you know, at the same uh, at the same time. So these sites could have once again many thousand years. Um, <laughs> we just our dating is not yet good enough um, to be able to pick up that. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So let's see if we got some more questions. Uh, we've got uh, Tim Mags also saying hello. Uh, oh, Andrew Kendall. Oh, hey. He's, uh, yeah. Hi, Tim. <laughs> he, oh, hi, Andrew. Andrew. Yeah, he says, thanks for a very interesting talk and uh, talking about in, uh, such interesting behaviors at so many sites and that you gave great Thank insights you, into the lives of these early people. Yeah. And then we got John Spiropoulos. Um, when, the, when you say that no flakes from reduction were found at the site, why is that not possible to think that these waste flakes could be found very nearby and as yet not excavated? So he's he's asking perhaps, you know, have you only excavated 
you know, into that part of the site. And perhaps the other material that um, is absent is just just in another in another square that you haven't excavated. Um. Yes. That. that thank you so much. Uh, that that could potentially happen, but um, when you have um, a signal from um, large cutting tools uh, t telling you that they all um, get dis discarded at this particular locality at the very end of their life cycle, right? When they just, and then you don't find flakes in this particular place. Just come so you have two sources of information to argue that maybe that 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 is not a production site. But then there are there are other other sources like if you had um, um, if you have some fragments, you can look at the cortex. Um, it's at the outside of the rock, which as you as you uh, nap it, the, the this outside gets sort of removed. But the, the, this 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 uh, variable is often used by archaeologists as a proxy for transport. So you could look at that, um, and um, yeah, there, there, there's there, there, yeah maybe they are somewhere to two hundred meters. These flakes are two hundred meters um, from the side that have and been discarded there. But then it's another question, right? Why they've been discarded two hundred meters, and then hominids came to this particular place and then did something else with their um, large cutting tools. So it really just adds. Um, to to another another I don't know side to the story, and, and I think it's just it's all work in progress, right? So my observations right now they ne they don't put the final kind of the final sentence um, of uh, of the book to the story of the Shulin earlier Shulin. Um, other researchers may come and notice something else. So it's it's really a rather a discussion and um, yeah, rather than like a statement. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, I think that answers that very nicely. Um, Tim has a question. Uh, he's about non-landscape issues. Um, some researchers have suggested that there are aesthetic qualities uh, manifested in LCTs, um, implements with fossils in the centre. Uh, the famous example from Katu, made on banded ironstone with colours symmetrical around the edge. What do you think about this, and is it even something we can ask in the Ashurian? Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Tim. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Tim. Um, yeah, um, there are researchers or I haven't seen papers published recently on the aesthetics of uh, large cutting tools but there was a discussion like 10 years ago on symmetry and uh, what because this um, not 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 so much earlier Shulin but later Shulin tend to be symmetrical right they have this teardrop shape and many researchers um, used to ask why is it what does this symmetry mean uh, is it uh, symbolic and there have been various um, um, various explanations for, for for what this could be a symbol um, standing for but um, I think and that, that's what I try to to convey uh, in uh, the discussion of could be four aside is a uh, at least there, I was also trying to see like like social um, social patterns, not just um, not just pragmatic uh, raw material source resources and all of that. But as I said, once we remove the from statistic the the influence of this pragmatic variable such as reduction, we didn't see any other signals. So at, for these sides, I, I I can speak that there's no. Uh, there's no um, influence of um, social organization. Uh, sorry, that's my dog. Uh, social <laughs> organization uh, or like different cultures between the sides. But um, in the yeah, uh, and then in the later sides, in terms of the spatial organization, once again, that's what we've uh, you, we've been just discussing of this time averaging that. 
uh, spatial organization and spatial patterns of this Schulian size is a very um, it's 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 a complex question and where you have to disappear the influence of geology and of time and it's uh, it's 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 not so um, it's not so easy yeah so mm. yeah, it's, um, yeah it's a very very difficult question to ask of, and of the, yeah and some yeah. some people probably would say that symmetry symmetry is um, has some some social meaning but i i i'm kind of i prefer the to to, to think that well first of all we have to explain the symmetry with um the the way the mapping works because if you lose the symmetry you will lose your angles of of the artifact and it will be hard like it will be hard to carry on mapping so you have to keep it symmetrical on both edges to, to, to be able to, to, to manufacture it, continue manufacturing it, and maybe then mm. make it. So for me, these are the predominant explanations of why they're so beautiful. Mm. <laughs> <I just don't laughs> agree. Yeah, and I, I guess it doesn't uh, mean that we won't find some other way of getting at that question um, in the future. Yeah, but um, yeah, I, I think that yeah, I think you really convincingly showed how strong the reduction influence is on, on, the, on the distribution in those four sites. Uh, what's the distance between those, those four sites in Kubi 4 uh, it's I think maximum is uh, like seven k's, seven kilometers. Okay. If it, yeah, if, if, yeah. Yeah. Um, to, to, yeah. So, some sites are very close. Uh, so this, um, the production sites, 65 and 63 they are like 500 meters away mm. from each other but other sites are a bit um a couple of kilometers uh away yeah okay yeah but not they're not hundreds of kilometers away yeah so they're all pretty relatively close to each other yeah and um yeah well th th then it gets into more um, complex issues of course if so if the sites are 100 kilometers so if we have earlier Shulin and somewhere, I don't know, in Asia and earlier Shulin in Africa. And we find that the patterns of a reduction are similar. The problem is that this earlier Shulin might not be complex enough to detect uh, differences in style and differences mm. in position, where, where you know that thousand kilometers, it's unlikely that hominins were passing the knowledge, right? It's, it's, we might be looking at convergence, but because this, um, at the early, uh, um, at the early um, phases of the Shulin, it's not complex enough for us to detect these traditions. Mm, mm. It's, it's, it's a big, very big question for me. When, when Shulin becomes complex enough, so you can uh, detect differences and potentially different um, traditions, um, when when can you do that um, in the Shulin? But uh, I have, haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> it's yeah, <laughs> it's, it's really yeah, <laughs> not so easy. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right, let's see. Uh, Tim says thank you. Um, and thank you yeah, I think I think that is it for the questions. Um, and John also says thanks for your answer. And just thank you for the clearing interesting talk. I think we'll wrap it up there, everyone. Um, it was a, an extended talk, very detailed, and I uh, hope you all in, enjoyed it. Um, thank you, Daria. It was thank you so really much informative. For staying, staying till the end. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So everyone, everyone stayed on. I can see um, all the all the members are still on, and um, it's been a well attended talk. And uh, yeah, we just really appreciate your time that you've taken to record such a professional and clear and well illustrated talk. Um, I, I think it's going to be well used in our archive and um, I hope everyone learned a lot. I certainly did. And uh, I hope you're going to have a lovely evening and um, go have a beer and enjoy it and uh, <laughs> give my, my best to Will. And uh, we'll, we'll chat so very much, soon. Nick. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you.